Now we have a dis disclosure. If you notice, there's six fingers on that hand. You're going to have to stick around if you're going to hear why there's six fingers on that hand. Well, your story does matter. In the last 32 years, I've written nearly 4,000 stories. Many of those stories were as a columnist offering my perspective on Green Bay Packer and SEC football games. In my, the last 10 years as a sports editor at the Montgomery Advertiser, one of my jobs was to put together a group of five columnists to offer their perspectives when Alabama or Auburn played in the national championship game. And rarely, if ever, did the columnist's ideas overlap. And that's remarkable if you think about it, considering how the games hinge on a, one play or another and how quickly we had to get the stories online. Look back to the 2018 game between Alabama and Georgia. That was decided on two at Tagliavo's touchdown pass and over time to Devontae Smith. Well, one of the columnist's ideas was on Tua. Here's a guy who hasn't played much, possibly even thought about transferring. Freshman gets thrown in the game, and he's a hero. One of them was on Jalen Hurts, the SEC player of the year that is benched after two years as a starter in the penultimate game and how he handled it and his character. One of the stories was about Nick Saban, who had the guts to make the decision to bench his starting quarterback and to put in an untested freshman at halftime of the national title game. Another one of the stories was on Georgia coach Kirby Smart and how he came this close to becoming the first assistant coach of Nick Saban's to finally beat him and let it slip through his fingers. The angle I took was from Montgomery kicker Andy Papanastas. And you look at the sway of what happened. He had a kick to win the game in regulation. Could have been a hero. And then if Georgia would have won, he would have been a goat. And for the rest of his life would have been known as the kicker that cost Alabama a national championship. The same thing, it was five different perspectives, same event. The Bible is a lot like that. There's a lot of different perspectives. The Gospels offer us perspective on the life of Jesus Christ, unique perspectives. We're just a few days from Christmas, and if you look at the Gospel of Luke, it has the story told through Mary. You have the manger and the shepherds and a babe wrapped in cloth. And then for Matthew, you have it through Joseph's perspective, and then you have the Magi coming from the east. But in our collective mindset, we put the two together. It's one story. Well, the Gospels offer unique perspectives on the life and the ministry of Jesus Christ. In Matthew, you have Peter trying to walk on water and ye of little faith. You've got the Great Commission to go and make disciples of all nations. In Luke, you have two of the most prominent parables the one of the Good Samaritan, how we're called to help everyone, even our enemies. And you've got the parable of the prodigal son, how no matter how far we've gone from Christ, he welcomes us back. And then you have John, and talking to Nicodemus and being born again, and it brings us the Bible verse John 3.16, that God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that if we believe, we will not perish, but have eternal life. You have rescuing of the adulterous woman from stoning. When Jesus says, you have not sinned, cast the first stone. And then he tells her to leave her life of sin. You've got Jesus washing the disciples' feet, an act of servanthood that all of us are to follow. And then you've got the resurrection appearance to Thomas. Blessed are those who have not seen, yet still believe. Those that I've mentioned are all unique to those Gospels. Now, picture if we didn't have those stories. Those stories shape our 
collective viewpoint of Jesus in our lives. But we know all perspectives that we face are not beneficial and true. If you look at the current political climate that we're in, it's difficult for us to stomach some of the things that we read. And I fear that we've reached a point of no return in our country. There is not one news source that I trust. I know too much. Now think about that the next time you're scrolling Facebook or flipping channels. There was an Iowa professor, he's in charge of the journalism program, and I got one of those alumni magazines in the mail and had an interview with him, and he was talking about the new journalism. And he said, reporters are asked to pick a side and then get the supporting evidence to prove their side. That's not the journalism I was taught. I was taught you do the research on both sides, and then you allow the reader, to make their decision. And that's the same type of philosophy that we're to take when we share our life of Christ with one another. Because there are times where we have struggled with God. There are times when God has felt far away. And there has been times when God has met us in miraculous ways. But for whatever reason, we don't like sharing our story. We may be embarrassed. We may be too shy. We may think that we don't know enough. But your story matters. And in this world of misinformation, particularly about Jesus Christ, the way, the truth, and the life needs to be told. And we're called to share it. But in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. This letter of 1 Peter was likely written in the last decade of the first century. It was probably not written by Peter who had died at that point, but by one of Peter's disciples. The letter had come from Rome where there was heavy persecution of Christians, and it was sent to five outlying communities that at the time were probably sporadic persecution of Christians. And the message was clear, to be ready. Live a life of integrity despite suffering. The entire letter is a manual of Christian faith on how we are to act. And one of the messages was clear, was to give a reason for the hope that you have, and to do so with gentleness and respect. Christians are to respond to misunderstanding and abuse, not only by patient suffering, but with a coherent explanation of the meaning of the Christian faith to outsiders who don't understand. And that's from the New Interpreter's Bible, 1 Peter 3.15. Mark Cahill played basketball at Auburn with Charles Barkley. Their careers overlapped three years, and they were teammates and roommates. He became an author and speaker after that, and one of the books that he wrote was The One Thing You Can't Do in Heaven. And what do you think that might be? To evangelize. Because once you get to heaven, everybody there knows him. But we know the people here do not know him. For the first time in U.S. history, the largest religious group is no religion. The nuns. N-O-N-E-S. Now, there are still a lot of Christians because 23% are Catholic, 21% evangelical, 11% Protestant. But the mere fact that one out of every four people lists no religion should terrify you. It should concern you. Cahill lists three different possibilities or outcomes for sharing your faith. 
First one is that you could plant a seed. And he characterized that as a winning situation. The second one, you could win someone to faith in Jesus Christ. And again, he characterized that as a winning situation. The third outcome would be that you would be rejected for your faith. And initially, he categorized that as a not winning situation, but he figured a batting average of two out of three was still pretty good. But then he came to the realization that it was much better than that. If you are insulted because of the name of Christ, you are blessed. For the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. So if you witness about your faith and you are rejected, you are winning. Blessed are you when people hate you, when they exclude and insult you, and reject your name as evil because of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day. Leap for joy because great is your reward in heaven. For that is how the ancestors treated the prophets. I'm going to focus on the first point of scattering seeds for a reason. Because not many of us have the opportunity or have had happened to us where we have shared our faith with someone that we didn't know and instantly brought them to a relationship with Jesus Christ. And I know people do not like to be rejected. I've lived in Alabama 10 years, and I've never seen anyone on a street corner holding up a brochure and talking about Jesus Christ. Now, I have seen that in covering national championship games in Miami, New Orleans, and then at a sports editor's conference in Las Vegas, but have not seen that here. We should be scattering seeds everywhere we go. There should be orchards sprouting up in our wakes. Neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything, but only God who makes things grow. The one who plants and the one who waters have one purpose, and they'll each be rewarded according to their labor. For you we are co-workers in God's service. Telling your own story by scattering seeds is less daunting. And there's a reason for that. It's your story. You know how God has worked in your life. This isn't like the journalistic perspectives of conservative or liberal when you're trying to figure out what is true and what is not true. Look at Saul. He's on the road to Damascus and he's struck down and blinded. He's told by Jesus Christ that he is going to be God's chosen instrument to tell the Gentiles about Jesus. Now, people are looking, isn't he the one that was persecuting Christians? Even the disciples were wary. Barnabas spoke an encouraging word and said, this guy's legit. The reason Paul, Saul, Paul was able to share his testimony, because his testimony is true. And it changed the world. Your testimony about how God has worked in your life is true. And you can change the world too. For how God has worked in your life can lead others to respond to God in theirs. My son, Anton, is here with Caleb Hines. And the two share a special relationship. Anton met Caleb between his junior and senior year at Troy when he was serving an internship at the YMCA in Prattville. He was leading a youth camp, and he met Caleb in the first day, and they began by playing cards with one another. Before the, the week was out, Caleb had shared with Anton that he was struggling with the death of his father. Well, Anton said that he couldn't do anything about that, but he said, I can be your big brother. And after that, a relationship blossomed. They would send 
text, emails, back and forth. They'd play video games online. When Anto came home from school, they would get together. They'd eat a Taco Bell. They'd watch a movie, kick a soccer ball around. When it came time for Anton to get married, Caleb was a groomsman in Anton's wedding. This is a photo of the marriage photo festivities. About a month ago, Caleb messaged Jill and said that he wanted to come visit us. And we told him, well, we live in Wetumpka now, so we're a little further away, and the day that you picked was the day that we're putting up Christmas decorations. So if you want to come, you still can, and he still came. But when he got there, he shared with us the impact Anton had on his life. He said not only was he struggling with the death of his father, but that he was bullied in high school. And there were times when he thought about taking his own life. But he said Anton was always there for him encouraging him, telling him you can do this, telling him that you matter. Caleb knew that God brought Anton into his life at that particular time for a reason. And as a father, knowing that your son stepped out and loved someone the way Jesus Christ tells us to love someone, it's powerful. Caleb has gone through basic training in the reserves and National Guard, and he's going to be certif- trying to be certified as an IT specialist. And it's a success story. And there's a power in testimony. You may think that in this world, in this day and age, that you can't do something that everything's to make a difference. Well, I'm telling you that you can. You can work here with Justin, with the youth. There are people, young adolescents growing up at the village church that could need your help. There's the Boys and Girls Club. There's the YMCA. We might even have a baseball ministry next year at Wetumpka, at Mulder Church. There's a group in Montgomery that is creating a program for at-risk young men. I'm trying to find out information because I would love for the people of Mulder to be a part of it. Because it sure would be better to be able to reach those young men then than if I had to see them in a couple of years in the prisons. It's all it takes. A few hours of your time to make a difference where you can take a potential tragedy and turn it into a triumph in someone's life. For how God has worked in your life can lead others to respond to God in theirs. In 2000, at New Year's Eve, there's a family photo of us sitting there on the sofa. And that was after a tumultuous week in our household. Heading into Christmas that year, Jill and I were traveling from Athens, Georgia, to go to Pittsburgh to visit Jill's family. Well, on the way up, the windshield wiper fluid in the receptacle in our van froze. So, I had to put some windshield wiper fluid in a Gatorade bottle and set it next to me so when trucks would come by and throw mud and you'd have to get the windows clean and I'd squirt it out front. Went to Pittsburgh and had a wonderful vacation. We were coming home and we were in a gas station in Somerset, West Virginia. And I heard a gasp from the passenger seat. Jill had mistakenly taken a drink of the windshield wiper fluid and felt the burning as it went down her throat. Went to the back of the van, got out the jug of windshield wiper fluid, and it said, if ingested, leads to blindness and death. 
I'd seen a hospital four miles back. We went to the hospital. And we brought in the jug and the receptionist or the nurse took one look at it and the blood drained from her face. They immediately took Jill away to have her stomach pumped. And then they brought her back and gave her five minutes to say goodbye to our children. Now you know where mommy's going to be if you don't see me again? Heaven. That's where mommy's going to be. If you don't see me again, I'm going to be in heaven. They put Jill in an ambulance and rushed her to Beckley, West Virginia, which is about 50 miles away. They figured they would have better facilities to handle if any of the complications that resulted. I went back to the same gas station, called family and friends throughout the country, talked to my then brother-in-law in Pittsburgh, who's a chemical engineer, and in his best bedside manner, he said, she's probably blind by now and she's going to be dead before she gets there. So I put the kids in the car seat headed toward Beckley. And I looked in the rearview mirror and I saw the terror in their faces. And I looked to my right in the empty seat. And I thought, what if Jill doesn't come home? Who is going to lead these kids in the Lord? Because it sure wasn't me. I was exposed. I was passive. Certainly wasn't doing what a man of God should do. I was following on Jill's spiritual coattails. And I made one of those foxhole prayers right then. And I said, Dear Lord, if you bring Jill home to me, I will be, do everything I can to be the spiritual leader of my home. Now, I didn't say anything about being a pastor. So, but here's, that's where we're at. So we go on the, follow the ambulance down to Beckley, and I walk, go, try to go in the hospital, and it was unlike a scene, any scene that I've ever experienced. It was a few days after Christmas. It's a small hospital, and there were 60 people lined up in the emergency room. They were out in the hall. I couldn't even find Jill. I finally found her, and they had her hooked up to an alcohol drip. The doctor's reasoning was that if the body began to process the alcohol, then the methanol that was in the windshield wiper fluid would pass through her body. If the, bo the body began to process the methanol, it would be like embalming her while she was alive. They even went to people that worked there to look in their lockers to make sure they had alcohol to be able to fill this IV so that for the next 36 hours she would have enough alcohol. Now, miraculously to me, in 36 hours, she was cleared to go home. She was alive, no problems with her eyesight. She had one heck of a hangover. We got in the car, and we're driving home toward Athens. I looked back at my kids, looked at my wife, said, God, here I am. Do with me what you need me to do. There's a power in testimony. Why do you think one of the reasons why I'm so passionate about men's ministry, about going into the prisons and leading these men and showing them how to have a relationship with Jesus Christ and be the husbands that they're supposed to be and to be teach their children, why we're doing the merge group for the resolution for men beginning in February? I've been there. I've messed up. So if you're a man out there right now and you're passive in your relationship with God, if you're passive in how you look at Christ, if you're not being the husband you're supposed to be, if you're not leading your children and you're thinking, I can't do this. I don't even know where to begin. I don't know enough. I'm here to tell you you can do it. All you need is to be able to say, God, this is yours. Take your heart and turn it toward him. For how God has worked in your life can lead others to respond to God in theirs. Now you might be thinking, 
That's not my life. Wasn't struck down by lightning on the road to Damascus. Didn't nearly kill my wife by some mistake that I made. My life's not as dramatic about as that. But every single person's spiritual journey in the eyes of God matters. We have some handprints that are on the wall that we put on the, ho- on the shack of our house in Prattville. Now, when we would, people would come to visit, we would place their hand in paint, put it up there, and Jill would write the names and the date that it occurred. When we were about to move in the spring, the realtor came in and saw the handprints and they said, oh, that's nice, but you're going to paint that over for, before you put this house for sale, right? I said, no, we're not. The hands and the lives represented are too important. I mentioned the six-fingered hand earlier. That's from a friend of mine, Greg Stivenberg in Wisconsin, that helped us start the Walk to Emmaus community in Wisconsin that works with Operation Christmas Child. And he put his hand up there, and he thought that he missed one. So he just took another finger and put it back there just to make sure so he has the six fingers. So that was one of the trivia questions we'd ask people to find the six-figured hand. But the lives of the people represented there. There's Molly Scott. Before she married Matt, became Molly Mobley and had three beautiful boys. There's my friend David Mullins who became a pastor later in life and died several years ago because of cancer. There's Dot Hawthorne the matriarch at Snowden, who's almost 90 years old. And we would meet in Sunday school class, and every so often she would share the story of how she felt the power of God come over her as a 12-year-old when she was lifted up from the baptismal font. It gives me goosebumps every time I hear. And I could go on and on. Of the lives of those that are represented. Each life represents someone made in God's image, nurtured in the handiwork of Jesus Christ. Do you remember those disco balls in the 70s and the 80s? You know, the ones that would shine their light in every corner of the room at a dance hall or a gymnasium? Well, your light, your life, is uniquely created to reflect to someone in a corner of this world unlike any other person that's specifically designed for them. In 2020, you're going to have opportunities to share testimonies here at Mulder. You can participate in one coming up on January 22nd. That's when Charles Wheeler and I will be up here doing a question and answer session. Charles is one of the graduates of the Resolution for Men class at Staten, and he was released in September. He found a hope in Jesus Christ again because of a letter-writing mentor that my friend Scott Carmichael wrote. There are seven men here at Mulder now, serving as letter-writing mentors to this next class of the Resolution for Men. I want each of them to understand the opportunity they have in the next few months. Because how God has worked in their lives can lead others to see God in theirs. We're a couple ways, days away from New Year's Eve. This time of the year, many people make a New Year's resolution. What they intend to do in the coming year. I've got one for you. To recognize the opportunity you have to scatter seeds in Jesus Christ's name by recognizing that your story matters. But how do you do it? First, you need to understand your story. 
And I'm not just talking about the basics. I'm talking to get into some of the nuances. Be a reporter. Look at it. Write something down. Prepare a longer version. Prepare a shorter version. Practice it. Second, you pray about it and seek opportunities to share it. Now, you could go up to somebody and say, do you know Jesus Christ? Let me tell you what he's done in my life. That's typically not what most people do. And it may not be doing it with the gentleness and respect from the first Peter verse. But God has uniquely put people in your life for the express purpose of you sharing Christ with them. Be prepared when that opportunity comes. There's a Zondervan study, and it says that less than 1% of Christians have shared their faith or their faith story with someone in the last month. Less than 1%. My hope, my prayer is that the people of Mulder will blow that statistic out of the water in the month of January. You're the only one uniquely able to tell your story. And it's an important story to tell. Your story matters. For the glory of God's kingdom, share it. Somebody's eternity may depend on it.